verse for the last several months has been 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Bring up slide one. This has been our title slide throughout the series, and we've been talking about uh, this. As a matter of fact, in 2021, we have had three uh, sizable teaching series that I've done this year. And uh, we did several weeks on ages, stages, and dispensations. We did a number of weeks on called to be holy. And now we've done a number of weeks on uh, the fight of faith. And I do have, I feel, some inspiration for the first of the year and a new direction on our Wednesday night Bible studies. I'm not quite ready to announce it yet because I want to confirm it in what I feel in the Lord. But I'm, I'm, I feel like it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be helpful to it. So then we went in this Fight of Faith series, and we've been through a bunch of stuff, uh, generational battles and, and <clears throat> the internal warfares and spirit of self-destruction, all kinds of stuff. Last session in part 13, we did the hedge of hindrance tonight. Bring up the other slide is the, uh, <clears throat> is the second half of that, the hedge of hindrance. But this is also, I got some strong things to say tonight. And I want you to understand that this is not just wrapping up this little portion of it. This is to wrap up the big picture of the fight of faith. I think I can sum up some things tonight uh, because the Holy Ghost is going to take us into another direction uh, after the holidays. Let's pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus, thank you for everyone that has come tonight and those that would be watching even online later. I'm asking you to bless all of our efforts bless our children's ministry and youth ministries tonight as they function in the name of Jesus. Amen. Turn around, find three or four folks, greet them in the name of the Lord, wave at them if you can't reach them. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Praise God. I want you to turn, uh, open your Bibles to the book of Job. And I want to just recap the part of Job that we read last week. Open up to the first chapter, verse 8. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, perfect and upright man, one that fears God and escheweth evil? We talked last week, about or two weeks ago, that before the banquet, that that is the definition, biblically, of an upright man or woman. Is that you gotta you gotta you gotta love God, but you we gotta hate sin too. We gotta escheweth evil. Now Satan responded in verse nine and said, "Doth Job fear God for naught?" And that word "naught" we talked about was was gratis in the in the uh, Hebrew. It was, it was without cost. Without cost. Satan's question that he was complaining about to God. Yeah, I see him. But let's be honest, God, you've done nothing but bless him. And he's serving you, but he's serving you without cost. Hast thou not made a hedge about him? This was his complaint against God. And about his house and about all that he hath on every side. You have blessed the work of his hand. The substance of his, uh, of his is increased in the land. Why wouldn't he serve you, God? Because you have altogether blessed him, and Lord knows I've tried to do something about it, but I can't because you've got that hedge around about. Now, we talked about the fact that a hedge is not a brick wall. It does knock down a lot of things, but it doesn't stop everything. And there's a reason for that. But there is a hedge, and I don't believe there's one just around Job. I believe there's one about every New Testament believer has a hedge about us as well. You say, well, the devil gets through it every once in a while. Yeah, he does, but I got news for you. You ought to see what he'd love to do if there wasn't a hedge. Amen? So here was, jo here was Satan's challenge. Put forth your hand, touch everything he has, and he'll curse thee to your face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And, and God was not going to touch Job. But he lowered the hedge which allowed Satan access. And notice he was able to touch anything except him personally. 
And that word hedge in the Hebrew literally meant to intertwine or shut in for protection. One translation renders it as a fence. I love that song we used to sing that we need to sing a little more. Jesus, be a fence all around me every day. I want you to protect me as I travel all the way. I got news for you. God does protect us. God's hand is on us. Can you say amen? And just as Satan complained against Job, he complains against this church. I promise you that. Now, we not only have a hedge, but we also showed in the last session that we have an angel that camps around about us. So we, we are in a war, and we're in warfare, but we're not helpless. And we're not, you know, so anyway, let's go back to the text here, and let's pick up now in, in the wrap-up session. We have an angel and we have a hedge, and I call it the hedge of hindrance because the hedge is not there to hinder us. It's there to hinder our enemy. And when you read Job's story, it's heart-wrenching. Uh, we talked about it last time. Servants came in one after another reporting calamity. It was like in waves. He lost all of his children. Uh, and he lost all of his wealth. It all happened in one afternoon. Uh, his, uh, the, uh, the only one in all of his family that he didn't lose was his wife. She backslid during the whole thing and would later pile on on him. You know, and, and, and so, I mean, he's getting it from just every angle. His friends did not understand his situation. They had never seen anything like it. Quite frankly, no one had ever seen anything like it. It was unprecedented. Job's story was unprecedented. And I said it in the last session. There's many people that have, that have suffered horrendous losses throughout history. But I don't know of anybody that suffered the same level of Job just by sheer volume and the swiftness of it. Now, it, let, me, let me read it. Go with me to Job chapter 23. And I want you to, th this is a, a passage where Job describes the, 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 the mindset he was in. He said in verse 2, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him. That I might come even to his seat I mean, that really summed up the condition Job was in. I, I, I'm trying to find you, God. I'm trying to see you. In, in what, what, I'm trying to understand what you're doing. But he couldn't grasp him. He couldn't even imagine. At, and, and, and in fairness, he couldn't grasp it because he'd never seen or experienced anything like it before. He said, I would order my calls before him and fill my mouth with arguments. If I could just find you, God, <laughs> I'd have plenty to say. I would know the words which he would answer to me and understand what he would say unto me. I, 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 I want to hear if you explain to me, God, what's going on. Will he plead against me with his great power? No. Now watch this. But he would put strength in me. Even in the midst of his situation, Job was convinced, uh, God, I can't seem to find you, but I know if I could, you'd put strength in me. You'd help me with this thing. That, that's quite a character issue right there. There the righteous might dispute with him, so should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he's not there. I tried backwards, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, but I cannot see him. The, the, look, look, there are times when we have to live up to the biblical reality that the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Uh, and none of us get, get to live life without being examined on that level. Now here's how Job ultimately got through it. He concluded, I can't find you, God, no matter what I'm doing, but I, but I know this. He knoweth the way that I take. I said it many years ago preaching. I said, I can, I can worship a God that I cannot see, but I cannot worship a God that can't see me. He said, when he hath tried me, now listen, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Now he's working off the assumption that God had done this to him. He didn't understand the big picture yet. 
But even if it had had been God, God, I know that when I come through this, I'll come through like gold. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from from the commandment of his lips. I, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. That's incredible. Incredible character. The more I read about Job and the more I consider Job, the more I understand what God told Lucifer about him when he said there is none like him in all the earth. He really was something different. And he stood out in character. It's good to see Brother Johnson home from school. Amen. Welcome home. Let's get back to Job. (laughs) <laughs> this time I want you to open your Bible and turn to the second chapter of Job now this is the words we don't like after, after living through a horrendous trial the first word of the next chapter is again again everybody say again there's times when we think that we're through it Only to find out, here it comes again. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among to present himself. It's it's Groundhog Day. (laughs) Same thing happening all over again. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? (laughs) He knew where he'd been. (laughs) And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Notice, he didn't even mention the hell that he had been bringing upon Job. It was a sore subject. Satan didn't want to bring it up. God answered him, asked him, where you been now? Just, you know, wandering around, checking things out. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job that there's none like him in the earth? He's telling him, he's reminding him again. A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity. That's why I believe this is a this is a second wave, because God was pointing out, after all you've done, he is still holding his integrity. This is what I was trying to tell you about Job. And though thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause, even God admitted there was no r- rationale behind this that Job deserved. God said, you caused me to lower the hedge. You touched his family. You took his wealth. And Satan answered and said in verse 4, skin for skin. Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. Now, Satan's first argument, first time around, is you you, you got a hedge about everything he has. Let me take everything he has, and he'll curse you to your face. He took everything he had, and Job still maintained his integrity. Now he's back for round two, and this time he says, I took his family and I took his wealth. Now, give me access to his health. You still have a hedge about him. I'm not allowed to touch him. Let me touch him. Satan was still complaining that the hedge was too high. And so he took his health, he took his family, now he's going to take, or his wealth, excuse me, now he's going to take his his health. That's the trifecta. Family, health, and wealth. What's left? What's left? And so verse 6, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he's in thine hand, but save his life. Now that's, a, in other words, you're saying you can do whatever you want, but you cannot kill him. Now Satan had authority to kill because he killed the rest of the family, but he could not kill Job. So, went, so, Satan, excuse me, so went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot, even to the crown. And he took him a posture to scrape himself withal, and he sat among the ashes. And then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Now guess where that came from? 
That was, that was what the enemy had whispered into here. By the way, here is where we find out that God killed all the rest of the family except her. Because Lucifer perceived that he would be able to manipulate her emotions. And he, was, he, could, he could use her to be a mouthpiece and just pile on. And, and he wanted to use her as a verbal tool to aggravate the pain and just twist the knife even more into Job's spirit. Now, in fairness, in fairness, she lost as much as Job did. But she didn't have the depth of his character and she didn't have the depth of his understanding. She obviously did not have the depth of his walk with God. And, and in the midst of it, she, her knowledge of God could not sustain the pain. And so in this trial, she backslid. And quite frankly, most, most would. I'm not being critical of Job's wife. I just think it is what it is. And, and she, she couldn't say, she, she backslid. And this is, where, this is where motive is tested within us. Do we love God just because we've been blessed? Do we love God just because we feel good? Do we love God just because we got food on the table or whatever blessing you want to call out? <laughs> None of this trial made any sense to her. And after he comes through it, he's still acting godly. And now he's covered with boils in pain. And if you've ever had a boil, you know how painful they are. And to have them all over your body would just be utter agony. And she sees him in this case. Her, her answer to it all is, why don't you just curse God and die? What are you fighting for? What are you trying to hold your integrity for? Let me tell you something. The voice of the backslid world is always very predictable. That's why when you're going through a time of trial, you need to be careful whose voice you're listening to. Because when you're listening, and it's, it's a marvel to me how people will take spiritual counsel from unspiritual people. That's always a marvel to me. They'll get their advice from people who aren't walking with God and, and think that somehow it's going to, well, I don't know, it makes sense. It makes no sense. I can't believe you kept your integrity. That's the logic of the backslidden. You lost everything else. Why not lose your soul as well? <clears throat> well, here's why. Of course, Job didn't know this at the time. But Jesus later on himself would say, What if a man were to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What would it be? What could he give for in exchange for his soul? In other words, you can lose everything you have but maintain your soul and you still come out a wealthy man or a wealthy woman. Because there is nothing that we own, there's nothing that we have, there's nothing in our account, uh, there's nothing in our possession, nothing that's titled to us uh, that can come anywhere close to the gift that God gave us uh, when he breathed into us the breath of life. And man became a living soul. And it's an eternal soul. And we have to value it. And how we value that soul determines what our motive is going to be. How we, how we value the spiritual part of us is going to determine the kind of decisions we're going to make when the pressure is on. And until you properly value your soul, you will always be vulnerable to deceit. Until... You decide that no matter what I have or don't have, above all else, I must be saved. Until that becomes sunk into your spirit and becomes part of your core thinking, you will always be vulnerable to deception, vulnerable to all kinds of stuff that will talk you out of it. Finally, in verse 10, uh, bring up verse 10. He said unto her, uh, this was Job's response to his wife. He said, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? 
Shall we receive good of the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And in all this did not Job sin with his lips. Now again, at this point, I want to remind you that Job was still working under the assumption that everything that was happened to him was because God was mad at him. He was working off the assumption that somehow he had failed God. Somehow he had displeased God. You know the routine. We all go through it every time something goes wrong. <laughs> we get a flat tire on the way to church and we're convinced, oh Lord, what did I do to displease you? <laughs> Washing machine blows up. Oh God, what, 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 <laughs> what have I done that's displeased you? <laughs> At this point, Job still had no clue what was happening in his life. He assumed God was angry with him because he had no other, no other thing to judge it and look at. His logic was, though, and even in that understanding and even in that paradigm, his logic was, but God, as I look back over my life, you've been mostly good to me. And so if you've been good to me, then, you know, okay, I, 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 then I, I guess I have to accept some bad along with the good. And that's what he was trying to explain to his wife was the rationale. <clears throat> the reason that Job was assuming that God was mad at him, if you'll remember, Satan made it look like the judgment had come from God. He made the fire come down out of heaven that destroyed his family and his livestock. And everything's there. And Satan is a master manipulator. He loves to do his work and paint it all the time as it's God's doing it to you. I want to tell you one thing I see in all this. We've been talking for the last number of weeks about spiritual warfare and, and fight the fight of faith and all that. Listen, you've got to be careful of the words you speak when you're walking through confusing times. So what's a confusing time? Simple. When you don't know what's going on. <laughs> I find the older I get... I have more days like that than I remember. <laughs> I don't know what all's going on. I used to thought, I used to think I know. I said it many times. I should have written my book when I was twenty, when I knew everything. Oh, yeah. More I question things as I get older. I, I don't know. I, 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 I think I know, thought I know, but I'm gun shy because <laughs> I've been fooled a bunch of times find out I thought one thing was going on with something else because Satan is a master at 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 manipulation and 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 he's smoking mirrors and here's the point when you're going through a confusing time rather than rattle off a bunch of frustration and speak a bunch of nonsense that you regret later and all sometimes it's just better to hush and say a little and just be silent and know that I am God. Now, let me show you something. Here is why the hedge is so important in our life. Because the only limitation that Satan respects is boundaries that are set by God. He does not respect boundaries that we set. He'll blow past those even just on principle. <laughs> Just because you wanted it, he'll blow by it. But he has no choice in honoring the boundaries that God sets. And if you'll notice, when God lowered the hedge, he didn't, he didn't lower it just random. He lowered it in stages, and he lowered it with conditions. And when you even the horrendous things Job went through, but Satan honored every, every line that God drew. And you got to know as a child of God that no matter what you're going through at any given time in the course of your battle for your faith, uh, you got to know that God still got lines drawn uh, and Satan cannot cross them. <clears throat> and, even, and even as he's honoring the lines because he has no choice, he still petitions God. He still puts in uh, complaints to the courts of heaven. He's filing complaints all the time. Lower, lower the hedges, lower the hedges, lower the hedges. 
He'll take advantage of everything he can. He'll, he'll, he'll take advantage of everything that he gets an opportunity to do. He will stoop to any level. He will do anything that he can to destroy you. Jesus said it the best. The thief comes but for to kill, steal, and destroy. Some of you need to stop trusting the devil. You say, well, 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 I'll just make a deal with the devil. That's like dealing with Congress. <laughs> You're going to make a deal with the devil. Well, I, I'll back off of this if, if, if he'll back off of that. He will honor no agreement made with you. Do not trust him. Now, I believe that we have come to the stage where we're at the tail end of the church age. And I think as a whole, we are living in a time of lowered hedges. And Satan seems, seems to have a lengthened chain a little bit. It, at least it feels that way. And when God lowered the hedge of hindrance, it was not out of anger. He was not mad at Job. He was not upset at Job. He was not disappointed in Job. As a matter of fact, Job didn't know this, but the exact opposite was true. The reason Job was going through what he did was not because God had, had any issue with him. It was, it was actually because God had such incredible confidence in him. And even though we all have a hedge... God does allow it to be lowered occasionally. And sometimes the purpose in lowering it has nothing to do with us. It has to do with others, things he wants to accomplish in others. That was the case with Job. And then other times when he lowers the hedge, it's because he wants to do a work in us. There's some things need to be worked out in us. I said it Sunday morning as we were closing. I felt the Lord was dealing with me about the fact that, that, that we have got to have a spirit-controlled temperament. And, and you know, if you, when you got, and, and one, of the most, one of the most incredible things that you need if you're going to make it any, any, for any longevity, you have to have a teachable spirit. And a lot of people have a difficulty having a teachable spirit. We know everything. We think we know everything. We, we are opinionated about this, that, and the other. And when you come across a tough piece of meat, you have to tenderize it. And sometimes that means slapping it on the counter and beating the fire out of it with a hammer. What are you doing? I'm making this a better piece of meat. <laughs> and sometimes when the, when the things are lowered, it, it's... Brother Tenney said it this way. He said, there are seasons of life, but then there are also times of seasonings. <laughs> Need to add a little salt here. Or maybe, maybe that's the problem. Maybe there's a little too much salt there. <laughs> maybe it's a little too salty. It needs to be humbled a little bit. It needs to be broken a little bit. It needs God is a master at operating the hedge in such a way that it will bring about the purpose he's after if we will just stay the course. Bring up 1 Peter 1, chapter 5 on screen. And we who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for, uh, for how long? Come on, yell it. Mm -hmm. A season. When God lowers the hedge, it's always for a season. It is not an ongoing thing forever. If need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being more precious than gold, that perish it, though he was tried it with fire, might be found unto praise and honor to the glory of the appearing of Christ. Now think about this for a minute. Where did Peter get that term? That when, when, when I'm done coming through my trial, I'll come forth like gold. I'll tell you where he got it. Uh, he, was a Jew, he was a Jew, and he got it being raised up in the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, and he got it hearing about Job. Job was the originator of that concept. 
the trial of your faith. Look at, look at that last verse. He said, you'll be found on the praise and honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. You know what? No matter what's going on, know this. It's all going to get worked out at the appearing. <laughs> Everything's going to get finished up at the appearing. In the meantime, there are seasons of difficulty that will come, and nothing you can do is going to keep it from happening. Nothing you can do can keep it from, from taking place. We have got to just understand that it's part of life and it's certainly a part of our walk with God because we are in a war. And sometimes the hedge lowers to just things in our temperament. And, and when I look back over my life, I have to admit something that I wish I didn't have to admit. But I have to admit that some of the most consequential times of change that happened in my life happened in difficult times. Now, I wish that I could say I was bright enough and smart enough to make all those decisions when the sun was shining <laughs> and not need any extra help from, from, from life's issues, but I wouldn't. Now, look with me. Turn, turn to Judges chapter 3. <clears throat> I want to show you something interesting. Judges 3 and 1 said, Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know, everybody say no, to teach them war at the least such as before they knew nothing thereof. Now, keep your finger right there because we're coming back to it in a minute. But I want you to notice something. There, there is something about the hell of war that tempers a generation. And it puts things in perspective. And it teaches that, that your life is not about comfort. It's about a greater cause. It's about a bigger picture. Uh, life doesn't revolve around you. And, 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 and when you're in the midst of war and, you're, and, and guns are, are blaring and and it's not all about you. And God was concerned about Israel because he was going to bring them into a place of blessing. But the problem was that he was dealing with a generation that didn't know war. And God was concerned that their lack of t being tempered was going to cause a thinking in them that was going to become reckless. And they would not be able to maintain what God was going to bless them with. So he left, even when he brought them into the land, he left certain amounts of the enemy there to fuss with them. <clears throat> the reason that the World War II generation is called the greatest generation is because they were tempered by tough times. Their parents had fought World War I. They had suffered through the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl of hunger, low wages. They fought World War II. They defeated Hitler and Nazism. They pushed back the tyranny of communism. They came home. They bought houses. They got married. They raised kids. They went to church in large, large numbers. They put men on the moon. They built the greatest economy in the history of the world. It was a tough generation. Now mirror that with today's generation. A generation that has not known hardship. Now it's true we've had war in, in the 21st century, but even at that, it, the cost has been nothing on the levels of the kind of wars I was talking about. We have a generation that, for the most part, has been raised up in blessing. They grew up with more gadgets than NASA had when they put men on the moon. It's a spoiled generation. Now, I'm not blaming it on them, by the way. I, it, life just, it is what it is. It, I, I think almost any parent that has the opportunity would, would want to, you know, we call it spoil our kids. And you'd say, well, I'd never do that. Yeah, wait till you become a grandparent. <laughs> All the logic is thrown out the door. So I'm not blaming it on the generation. I'm just saying, I'm just diagnosing it. It is what it is. 
I'm, and I'm not talking about individual. I know there's, there's a, obviously exceptions to that. I'm just talking about a big, big picture. We have a generation that has, that has grown up with life being everything about them and not others. Now, what that's done is they are throwing away societal norms. They have embraced homosexuality. They have embraced this transgender nonsense. And I'm sorry if that offends you, but I, I'm going to call it what it is. It is utter nonsense. Not just nonsense. Utter nonsense. That I can choose what I want to be. That I can, that my child, we have a generation that thinks four and five-year-olds are able to choose whether they can be a boy or a girl. And we have adults that act like it's enlightened. That's nonsensical foolishness. And we need to stop patty caking it and tell it what it is. We've had to patty cake a generation so long, that's why we're in the mess we're in. They think children can choose what, what sex they want to be. This is what happens when a generation turns inward and has nothing to challenge it, to cost it, to make it pay a price, and God knew it. And God was concerned that that kind of generation was going to ruin everything he was trying to bring into Israel. And so he left some, some enemy there to prove them, to teach them war, because they knew nothing of it. Go, go back now to Judges 3 and pick up with verse 3. Namely, everybody say namely, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hevites that dwell in Mount Lebanon from Mount uh, Baal Hermon unto the entering of Hamath. And they were there to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandment of the Lord which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. God was literally acknowledging that he does not know if they're going to serve him until they are put under duress. Satan even understood it. And his complaint to God about Job was, yeah, he worships you every day, but you've never allowed me to put him under duress. The truth is, God brought Satan's attention to Job. Job didn't know it, but God trusted Job to keep his integrity of faith even in the midst of the battle of his life. <clears throat> Hast thou considered my servant Job? Hey, devil. Have you examined him yet? God. Yeah, 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 he knew he was chomping at the bit. Have you observed how steady he is? Have you observed how faithful he is? God knew exactly what Satan was going to do because he knows Lucifer's character. Lucifer can't help it. He's going to be what he is. And that's why, by the way, God told him, you can do whatever you want, but you can't kill him. God had to draw a line because he knew that's exactly what Satan wanted to do. And Isaiah, bring up Isaiah 54 for a minute. I want to show you something beautiful. Verse 16. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. He, he, the thing you need to know about that kind of verse is when you go back to the Old Testament smiths, the only way they had to crank up the heat of the fire is those billows. They would crank them and blow air. In, and when they would do it, it would heat the fire. But they had no instruments. They had no thermal stats. They had no thermometers. They had none of the stuff that we use. The only way that an old-fashioned smith uh, could judge the level of the heat of the fire is he would put his own hand uh, in over it a little bit and learn how to test it. Learn how to, by the feel of it, he would know what it is. It needs more. Heat it, heat it a little more. Uh, or he would have to cool it down. No, nope, that's a little too hot. Enough. But the point is, uh, is that the smith uh, was never unaware of the level of heat that was going on because he tested it with his own hand. And when God was telling Isaiah that I am the one that created the smith, I'm the one that blows the coals, I'm the one that tests the heat and makes it hot or makes it cool, I'm the one that has tested it with my own hand.
That's why, verse 17, no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise up against thee in judgment shalt thou condemn. Here it is, folks. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. The heritage of the people of God is not that we live such a blessed, prosperous life that we never have trouble. That's not our heritage. Our heritage is that we can go through all kinds of crazy, but we come out on the other side standing with our faith intact and our integrity in order because of the help of the Lord. Now hear what I'm about to say. Hear me. Hear what I'm about to say. No matter how I feel, no matter how you feel in any level of time of this war, know this. My trial is never out of control. Now Job thought it was. And sometimes we have thought that it was. But the reason it's not out of control is because it's tempered by the hand of God. Can I remind you of something? Job was one of the first books of the Bible that was written. He lived around 2200 B.C., more than likely a contemporary, give or take a little bit, of Abraham's day. It means it's been, about, it's been over 4,000 years since Job walked the earth. But when Job was going through all this stuff, he did not have a Bible. He had no scripture to turn to. He had no thing that he could turn to to give him comfort or understanding. His love for God and his integrity of character of, the, of his spirit created the promises that we have in the Bible today. And the book of Job has sustained millions of people through trials. I, I don't know any saint of God that's worth their salt that hasn't been driven to the book of Job every once in a while. How many of you would say, I've, I've found comfort there from, from time? I've been ministered to by the story of Job. I've been, yeah, look, look at that. Guess what? So have millions of people for the last 4,000 years. Uh, do you understand now what God was after? Uh, he wasn't trying to destroy Job. Uh, he was getting ready to turn Job into one of the greatest evangelists uh, and disciple-making uh, people that, that the earth had ever known. But Job didn't know it. God was using Job's character to establish great gains for the kingdom of God that would unfold until the end of the church age. And the world is watching us. Our generation is watching us. The God of Job is not just an old story in dusty pages. Uh, he's here right now working in our time and our day. All of us are epistles known and read of all men. Uh, and the people that are reading your pages need to be reading uh, pages of stability uh, and pages of integrity uh, and pages of faith. They ought not to be seeing, our children don't need to be seeing pages of all up and down and left and right and unstableness. These latter times of the church age are a season of lowered hedges. Like Brother Tenney said one time, he said, God didn't write a bad book. And that includes the book of Job. We got to learn how to deal with those times that the hedge gets lowered in our life. He will lower it at times, but there's always a purpose. It is never random, and it's always temporary. He will raise it up again. He will reestablish the angel again. Job's mantra through all of his trials was, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job never ceased worshiping God. How many people have I known through the years? They get discouraged and they just stop coming to church. They, they feel like, you know, whatever. And they get, you know, I, I just stopped worshiping. I just stopped. Job never stopped worshiping. He never stopped talking to God. 
even if it was just to complain. <laughs> but he still kept the channel open. He lost everything except his personal character. He really, really was an incredible man. I think God diagnosed him exactly correct. There was nobody in the earth at that time that was like Job. And we know because that generation ended up becoming full of violence and all kinds of men. Nobody had lived up to Job. The key to all of it, as I said, Job never stopped talking to God. And even the life of Jesus teaches us one thing. Before there ever comes a crown, there's going to come a cup that we wish could pass before us. But we're going to have to drink it if we're going to get to the crown. He lost everything but his character. Hear me. Hear me right now. He didn't blame God for the things he didn't understand. As a modern-day pastor, if there was one thing that I could say I have seen people make an error more than anything, it's that one. Because we don't understand something, we get confused. And, and so many people make an error here. And, and when we don't understand something, we assume that there's no sense to it. Just because we don't understand it. What's it? It's nonsensical. This doesn't make any sense. God's not right. God's not fair. God, God's unjust. This is where the atheist comes in. That's their complaint against God. Why is there so much evil in the world? Why this? Why that? Why this? Why that? But Job never stopped talking to God. And the key to his recovery was that he never lost his faith in God. And one way that he protected his faith is he never let negative voices rule his thinking. Amen. Oh, and while he was going through all this, he was the generator of many notable quotables. It was Job that came up with the saying that we, we, we quote all the time, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. You don't come up with slogans like that when the sun's shining. That's stuff you learn in the pit. Job was the one that came up with the saying, I know my Redeemer lives. Job was the one that said, when I am tried, I will come forth as gold. Uh, long before the Psalms talked about it. Uh, long before the Gospels talked about it. Uh, long before the Epistles talked about it. That man paid a price for what has helped stabilize the faith of millions of people throughout history. And the whole time he had no clue what his per life purpose was being unfolded. He thought God's mad at him. He had to endure the dark night of the soul. The dark night of the soul is what happens. What I have observed is it's the thing that happens just prior to a manifested glory. Now again, in these last 15 minutes, I want to I wrap up this whole several weeks of teaching with this kind of concept. There's a difference between just enjoying the presence of God occasionally and enjoying the manifest presence of God that is consistent. Let me show you. Genesis 28, bring it up on screen, verse 16. God had visited Jacob in his sleep. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. I had an encounter with God. He woke up. Now, I'm, I'm going to get into, if I, if I do what I think I'm going to do after the holidays... We're going to come back to that story and we're going, we're going to deep dive into it and, and talk about where Jacob was when he had this dream. 
Because if you'll remember, the next verse, I think it was, says that he concluded that this was the gate of heaven. Now we're going to get into that later. All I'm wanting to point out now is that he had a visitation. We have times of visitation, now, but he, he did not have anything that stabilized the presence of God in his life. We come to church, and we want God to pour out on us all the time. But sometimes we don't want to pour ourselves out to God. We want him to do the, all the pouring. Lord, you do the work. I don't want to have to pour out on you. Jacob, God did pour out on Jacob. God did come and meet him, gave him an incredible experience, but it was in a dream. And he admitted, I was in the, I was in the place of the Lord, and, and I, I didn't even know it. Now, I'll tell you when Jacob knew it. It was down the road. When he ended up in that experience wrestling with an angel all night long. And, 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 and the angel is telling him, let me go. And Job, or, I'm sorry, Jacob said, not until you bless me. Not until you bless me. See, at the night of the dream, God was pouring out into him. But this night, Job was pouring out unto God. He was pouring out everything within him. He was crying out to God, no, not until you bless me. Not until you bless me. And don't think for one moment that that angel couldn't afflict Jacob off uh, like, a, like a, a flea. But there's something about human hunger that draws God. And he was, he was reaching out all night long, not until you bless me, until finally the angel touched a hollow of his thigh, changed the way he walked for the rest of his life. All that was symbolic of what happens and the difference between when God pours out onto us and when we pour out into God. Life-changing experiences don't happen when God pours onto you. It happens when you and I pour out into God. The dark night of soul is when you hit a brick wall without any explanation. Nothing works right. Despair and discouragement hovered over you like a dark cloud and we feel helpless and frustrated. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And there are times we go through trials that, that get us so physically and emotionally drained. <coughs> and when, <coughs> excuse me, when that happens... That's when the tempter comes to torment us with temptation. Too many have come to those times and retreated. That's not the answer. When you're in the midst of those times in the dark night of the soul, the answer is not to turn around and run. The answer is to press on, even if it just means you've got you to gotta help put one foot in front of the other. Somebody said, how are you doing? As I'm going through hell. Somebody said, whatever you do, don't sit down. Keep walking. Keep walking. Sometimes we feel saturated by God's emptiness more than we do his presence. But that doesn't mean that he's not there. Job said, I can't feel you, God. I don't know where you are. But he acknowledged that that is my problem. That's not God's fault. I know, God, you're still here. Even though I can't see you. And even though I can't figure what in the world's going on. And I have no explanation for this chaos. Just keep praising him. Keep your integrity in place. Keep praying. Keep believing. Keep walking in faith. Keep your commitments that you made to God. That's what's being challenged by the enemy. Lowered hedges, or what I, what I would call lower hedge trials, is, is about bringing us to a place of manifested presence and glory of God. In other words, usually after these seasons, God raises the hedge back up and he restores the angel that we thought had been on vacation. <laughs> and then he will begin to reveal to us a greater thing a greater power, a greater understanding, a greater anointing, a greater 
ability to know him. You see, the reason it's important to keep walking no matter what's going on is because no matter how deep your valley is, if you just keep walking, it will lead you to another mountaintop. Valleys, by definition, require two mountaintops. I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. <clears throat> the hand of God on a person's life will bring about two things. It's going to bring great respect from the church, and it's going to bring great attack from the devil. <clears throat> Satan's attacks are often seem as awesome as the move of God in revival. There's been times it seems like God has moved on me and I felt the anointing and there's other times I've been under such attack it, it, it seemed to be almost as great as the presence of God was, only in reverse. And this church has a history of attack. We've been at war for all the years I've been here. <clears throat> but I... But I noticed when I look back over it, there's seasons and times of war, and, and, and sometimes it, it, it was horrendous. But I look back, and, and I notice that after all of them, I have to testify, there came a ratcheting up to another level. <laughs> something happened. Something changed. Something, and where we are today is, is, not, a, uh, is not a story of, of, of the moment. It's a compendium of everything that's happened. That's brought us to where we are. 2015 and 16 were the worst years of my ministry. Horrible affliction. But I have to admit, after that, something started changing in the church. It was slow at first, but then I, I, I could feel it. It, it Something deeper started taking place. Then COVID hit. And it seemed like that after that was passing, God started ratcheting things up even more. I'll give you an example. All the years I've been here, I've tried to teach us to be generous to missions, and we have. Based on you know what we have, we have been faithful. But God's doing something new that I can't fully explain. Because so far this year, in 2021, with our numbers a quarter to a third at times less than what we had before COVID, was, uh, it, just the first 11 months of this year, we have written checks and given $176,500 to missions costs. <laughs> Never seen anything like it. I, I can't explain it. Something new is happening. And it's a God thing. And Satan is angry. I had a talk with Brother, Brother uh, Grimsley while, while he was here. He and I were just chit-chatting. And I, I, said, I, I said something about it. He, he said the things we've been through. And I said, yeah, I don't know. I, for the life of me, I don't know what I've done that, that you know, causes him to be so... I don't know what I did to get on his radar. <laughs> Like this, I'm just a pastor of a local church, and in the, in the passing, he was asking me something about missions. I said, "Yeah, we've given like 176 thousand dollars this year to missions alone, and he and, and probably and over three million plus uh, over the years have been." He looked at me, he said, "And you don't know why <laughs> that you're a target?" I said, "Well, I hadn't really thought much about that. I just..." I got to tell you, 2021, in the midst of that year where we've given that kind of finance and had that kind of impact, I know many of you have been through it. Not everybody, but many have. But my family has had a horrendous year. The hedge lowered even a little more. And we started out the year with my wife's diagnosis of cancer. Got through all that, and radiation and surgery and all the things that we do and seemed like we get into it. And then she ends up breaking both wrists at the same time and 
five weeks in Ohio and still are the one to run we still hadn't healed right. And if, if God doesn't heal her, we're looking at having a whole nother surgery again on that one, which is going to affect it again. And my personal finances have been hammered. I mean, if God is trying to tenderize my checkbook, he has done so. Because <laughs> somebody's been using a hammer on it. And I was happy because when COVID came, I went into, I went into you know, management mode. And I, I, I got frugal. I wasn't spending, you know, and I actually had built up a little. I thought, hey, you know what? This is, you know, I'm not eating out. I'm not doing this. I, I've actually got a little bit on the side. of Okay. And I didn't even take a raise. I didn't, there wasn't any change. It was just I was spending less. <laughs> and evidently the devil noticed it too. <laughs> All of a sudden, I've been hammered in the last 13 months. I've had to put two, two new HVAC, uh, HVAC systems into, in, into uh, rental houses. I've had to put a new roof, new gutters, blown engine in my truck. Personally, over almost $25,000. Uh, the church has been crunched. We've had, the last I checked, over $42,000 in repairs and maintenance issues. And I don't know, I don't remember if that even includes what we got to do next week when, the, when, the, when they come in and finally put these heater coils in and fix our furnace. And that's an $8,000 check that's going to hurt my heart to write. <laughs> and then we just went through this crazy chaos where we couldn't find insurance. No one would write our, our vehicle fleet. Even agents were telling me they've never seen anything quite like this. I even had an agent that got promoted in the last 30 days in the company that started the whole fiasco. And he sent me a note and apologized, said, I want to apologize for what this company did to you. One agent that's 80 years old or over 80 years old, been in the business for 50 years, said, I have never seen a local church being treated the way your church is being treated right now. Well... There was, no, there was no sense. It was spiritual warfare. The hedge has been lowered. Now, here's what I'm, I'm saying. I'll have to say this in this last few minutes. My experience in 34 years of riding the chaos is that in these seasons, though at times they're horrendous, my experience has been when they settle down and God raises the hedge again, we come to a season of something new happens. I'm saying to you, something new is going to manifest in Norfolk Apostolic Church. I really do believe in this next year. Satan has come to challenge it in the courts of heaven. And God's allowed the hedge lowered for a season, but, but at some point along this path, it's going to rise back up. And I feel that it's already begun to rise back up again, and we will see a more manifested glory of God. Bring up real quick Job 42 on screen, because uh, you, can't, you can't end this series and, and talk about all this without going here, because the Bible says at the end, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job, more than his beginning. Job thought he was blessed before. And he went through hell on earth, literally. But at the end of the time, he ended up in a position that was greater than anything he had ever experienced when he was younger. This time he had 14,000 sheep. 6,000 camels, 1,000 a, 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 a yoke of oxen, 1,000 she-asses, and he had seven sons and three daughters. And, one, one, and, and, and part of it says, and, and there were none like his, his kids, and they, his daughters were as fair more than anybody in the earth. Here, here's the point. Before you go judging a matter, you might want to remember that you can't judge a matter until it's over. And sometimes it takes a long time to judge a matter. And when you're going through the chaos of it, it 
it feels and looks like God's not fair. But I'm here to tell you from experience and from the testimony of the book, if you just keep on walking, keep on, keep focused, keep on praising, keep on loving truth, you'll end up being able to look back and judge a matter. Skip down to verse 16. After this, everybody say after this. Job lived 140 years. Now, I don't think that's going to happen to us. But he saw his sons and his sons' sons and even for four generations. And I think that the reason that God allowed that longevity with him, because God's just. God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you decades to watch my goodness to you. And so Job died, being old and full of days. And I can't think of any better way to die. Job lived long enough to see his blessings manifested. Earlier, he could not find God. But because he stayed the course, he stayed the course long enough to gain a testimony of God's faithfulness. And sometimes those are not just two week ordeals. The greatest battles and the greatest victories and the greatest life changing things sometimes are things that take quite a long time to work your way through. When Mary broke the alabaster box onto Jesus, there were some that were around that got upset. Why is this waste being done? We could have given... To the poor. You know, there's always people that sit around talking about doing something for God. They just never do it. <laughs> yeah, we could have given it to the poor. Why, why, didn't, why, didn't, why don't you get to work on that? Mary didn't just talk about it. She did it. And she came in and broke open her soul. She wept and wiped tears with her hair. Because that night, she was not asking God to pour out on her. She was pouring out onto God. And God was so moved by it that he t said that when, for, for the rest of history, wherever the gospel is preached, the story of this woman is going to be told. When we pour ourselves out onto God, we are at our limit and we're holding on sometimes to just shreds of promises. And sometimes it looks pretty sad. But just remember, in our weakness, He is made strong. And there's always a time when suddenly God shows up and shows out and something changes. And you look back over it. And though you don't want to go through it again. But you end up testifying. It was worth it. It was worth it. I leave you with one last verse. Psalm 68 and 1. To the chief musician. A psalm or a song of David. Let God arise. And let his enemies be scattered. Let them also hate, those that hate him flee before him. You may feel like the enemy is chewing on your household like a bunch of termites. But if you'll hang tight and just keep on praising, keep on walking, be careful, don't get, don't get crazy with your tongue. It will mature you and it will grow you. And it'll change you and adjust your character. And that oftentimes has to be done in us in order for us to sustain what God desires to lay on us down the road. You cannot build a beautiful house on a weak foundation. So when you're exhausted, hold on to your confidence. The hedge will come back. Stand with me tonight. Praise God. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house.
Why don't somebody join me right now? Lift up your voice and begin to praise God. Dear Jesus, we exalt you and we love you. Oh, God, I feel the Holy Ghost so strong right now. And in the name of Jesus, I loose this teaching into this assembly. I, I loose these 14 lessons uh, on the fight of faith. Uh, I loose all of this word into this assembly. Lord, let it become food for our soul. Let it become the thing that takes us through whatever is going on. But Lord, we know that when the hedge comes back up, there's a new day dawning and a new thing coming and we give you praise and glory and honor for it. In the name of Jesus. Now everybody in here, clap your hands of the Lord. And give God a shout of praise unto Him. Come on, lift your voice. And praise. Hallelujah. No matter what you're going through. Hallelujah. Never stop praising Him. He katandino lo mo shatahaya. Halanamando ho shatakaya ando la shatahaya. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you for being faithful to the house of the Lord. Sunday morning, Sunday night is going to be a great time. Please stop by the kitchen. Brother Collier and them feel be back. Somebody's ready. They got a bunch of produce and stuff to be a blessing to you. God bless you tonight. Have a great evening. We're bless you in the name of the Lord. God bless.